Kavirlai. Good evening. Welcome to iFocus 78. This is Neuro-Ophthalmology third lecture. In fact, there are two lectures today by Professor Rohit Saxena and uh, Dr. Devendra Venkatramani on optic nerve function test and electrodiagnostics. I request Ashmin to introduce them and then they will start the lecture. Uh, thank you, Santosh. So now we move track and we go to the investigations uh, part of neuro-ophthalmology and uh, it's an absolute, absolute pleasure and honor to have uh, Professor Rohit Saxena who joins us from Delhi. Uh, he's a professor of uh, pediatric ophthalmology, strabismus and neuro-ophthalmology and one of the most beloved uh, teachers uh, in the country. He's also currently the secretary of uh, Indian Neuro-Ophthalmic Society. Uh, he'll be followed by uh, Dr. Devendra Venkatramani, who will be talking to us on uh, electrodiagnostics. Uh, Devendra boasts uh, a, a very good pedigree. He did his DNB from Shankaranitralia, and then he did his fellowship from Elu Prasanda Institute, and he's currently uh, director at uh, Lakshmiya Institute, Kanwil, and is a retina surgeon. Uh, welcome, both of you, and over to you, Rohit. Thanks, thanks, Rashmin, and thank you, Sandosh, for having me here. I'll just start my slide share. So, uh, screen visible? Yes, sir. Great. So, I'll, I'm, I'm talking basically on optic nerve functions, and it's something, uh, you know, akin to neuroophthalmology per se, that in whatever we do, we borrow from glaucoma, retina, and all those places. So, uh, this will kind of be uh, remind you of all your other speciality lectures and some of the neuroophthalmology lectures that have just gone by. So we put all these things together and try and bring together an optic nerve function assessment and what we need to do to actually understand uh, common optic nerve pathology. So what are the common ones we are looking at? Uh, of course, congenital anomalies, you should always be wary of. Glaucoma uh, is very, very frequently misdiagnosed. And unfortunately, often uh, coexists with the neuroophthalmology dis uh, disorder. So sometimes pituitary adenomas may present with raised intraocular pressure because they are secretory adenomas and result in steroid increase in the body, causing a steroid responsive glaucoma. And the progressive field effect kind of misses the neuro underlying neuro neurological or neuroophthalmological defect. So that's the other thing that needs to be you know, aware of inflammatory optic neuritis and its various presentations, ischemic, raised intracranial pressures, compression of the nerve, toxic and nutritional neuropathies, trauma, inherited neuropathies, infiltrative, and of course, optic atrophy secondary to retinal diseases. And basically, retina and optic nerve are kind of completely, you know, go hand in hand because after all, the optic nerve is nothing but the axons of the ganglion cell layer which is very closely connected to the bipolar layer, cell layer and, of course, the rods and cones. So all these come together into the optic nerve, and that's the dysfunction that we're going to talk about, about assessing that. So the key presentations would be reduced visual acuity, dyschromatopsia, decreased light uh, brightness sensitivity, decreased contrast, various kind of field effects, Pupils, you've had a wonderful uh, talk previously just some time back on pupils. So RAPD assessment, disk evaluation, visual evoke potentials that will be covered today uh, and, and a bit about imaging. So this put together are optic nerve tests for assessment of optic nerve functions. And before I go on to the core optic nerve assessments, it's always no examination investigation is in isolation. You cannot assess or evaluate or diagnose anything just on one assessment. So always, even when you suspect an optic nerve pathology, look at other issues that may be there because they may help us to diagnose a lesion, especially if there are other associated problems like ocular motility needs to be evaluated, orbits for proptosis, congestion, chemosis, any thrill, decreased corneal or facial sensations, uh, prominent temporal arteries, and of course, always in neuro-ophthalmology, do a complete neurological examination and sometimes a fair amount of systemic examination, the simplest of being a blood pressure, we'll see how that also comes into importance. So we run through key things, best corrected visual acuity, always. Uncorrected presenting visual acuity is never enough. If you don't have or you don't know the refractive error, the patient is not carrying the glasses, a pinhole at least. 
we have burnt our fingers not doing our best corrected and on follow up once you do a refraction you realize the vision is improved and you were you know kind of racking your brains for utility so a best corrected visual assessment vision is the most sensitive indicator for early visual dysfunction and by vision i just don't mean visual acuity so vision consists of visual acuity color contrast feels and stereopsis so assessment of all these five components of vision is essential so best corrected visual acuity contrast you can do contrast by simple peliropsin and even early contrast reduction can be an important sign of an optic nerve dysfunction of course it can be seen in any other eye pathology like macular dysfunction or even uh, early cataracts but if you are suspecting an optic nerve pathology contrast is essential then color vision this chromatopsia is a very sensitive color vision uh, uh, optic nerve function or a, 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 a symptom again it is important either in the presence of a normal visual acuity that color is significantly affected you strongly suspect an optic nerve function optic nerve problem or else there is subnormal visual acuity but the color perception or the color is significantly worse as compared to the corres the corresponding visual acuity so we know poor vision or subnormal vision color will be affected but in these conditions where optic nerve dysfunction is is there the color is far more uh, affected than what would normally be seen in say a cataract with similar visual acuity and then the most important examination which helps us for a lot of understanding or identifying a lot of issues for optic nerve and behind are visual fields so you should know what are the normal visual field parameters we are looking at it's far more uh, the field is larger temporally it reduces uh minimum on the nasal side and superior and inferior and you can see the blind spot dimension somewhere you can identify the blind spot that would be about between 12 to 18 degrees uh, on the uh, on the uh, chart and horizontally and vertically its dimensions so any enlargement any change in position any anything any scotomas arising from the optic nerve all can help us to diagnose conditions we all have seen this this chart in our mbbs books and it is the key field assessment ideas that we get so you can separate out optic nerve dysfunctions and retrochiasmal so optic chiasma is the is the point at which both eyes start getting involved and anterior to that you need to differentiate between retina and optic nerve defects so we'll run through some of the optic nerve defects so the key thing is the what what is the kind of field that i want to do the best and the most important is a confrontation field so all of us must know how to do a confrontation field how what target to use you use a bright target the distance and place the object coming from the side between you and the patient and of course you are comparing your own field with the patient's field assuming that your field is normal you can do a goldman kinetic perimetry which is not so common these days and automatic sta automated static perimetry where you can do thresholding or you can do a screening the key is that some amount of visual acuity is essential before you can do a visual function assessment and usually 660 is barely um, you know is bare minimum for you to be able to assess and of course the patient should be psychologically and physically stable he should be alert these are key things before you can do again you can do a lot of fields in many ways like i said confrontation is probably the best and the earliest but yeah if you want to document you can do an automated you can do a screening fields itself because in neuro ophthalmology we usually tend to have absolute scotomas and that can be easily picked up even in a screening field uh, a goldman kinetic perimetry can chart out the field defects very clearly and that's why you are able to localize the lesions better but if you don't have that you can just go ahead with the 30-2 also and most of neuro ophthalmological conditions can be picked up so this is a kind of field you can see uh, had enlarged blind spots and correspondingly look at the fundus there is papilledema so that's what you expect an enlarged blind spot in a patient of papilledema you look at central and centrosecal defects you're looking at optic nerve dysfunction because of optic neuritis toxic optic neuropathies like ethambutol alcohol toxicity and leber's hereditary optic neuropathy so the type of fields very strongly suggests the possible etiology behind it 
while the NAION can present in any possible field, but the most common field is an altitudinal field effect. So you will see uh, most commonly the inferior field gone in a patient of NAION. So again, the type of field effect is very strongly suggestive of the possible etiology or the cause for visual dysfunction. The pupils, as has been discussed in a previous lecture, now, on this very platform, the pupillary light reflex is very, very important and perhaps one of the most sensitive clinical tests for optic nerve dysfunction. And RAPD is present even in very, very small, very, very early optic nerve dysfunctions and is usually not present in a retinal disorder unless it's a large retinal disorder affecting a fair amount of macula or a large retinal area. So you would usually not see a significant RAPD in uh, uh, retinal disorders, but in very mild optic nerve dysfunctions also, it will be one of the earliest things. So never forget to evaluate the pupil, never be in a rush to dilate the patient and look at the fundus. The pupils, the vision uh, will give us a lot more information in the very first instance itself uh, rather than just missing out on these signs and then worrying about and calling the patient back again or missing them in the viva. So these are key questions that are always asked in a neuroophthalmic exam. The next key assessment is to, of course, dilate the pupil and look at the optic nerve head. Always, and of course, now in Corona times, we are almost completely shifted to a, a slit lamp biomicroscopy, but always remember a binocular assessment of the disc is a key investigation. Never rely on a, on a uniocular assessment like a direct ophthalmoscope. So if you want to screen the retina, you look at use an indirect. And when you want to see the disc or any part of the retina, closely use a slit lamp biomicroscopy, a 90D or 78 or whatever you're comfortable with. For the disc, look at the color, the size, the shape, the margins, the, the cup, the nature, the size of the cup, the neuroretinal rim, the vessels as they emerge from the disc, and of course, the peripapillary area. So the optic nerve head assessment becomes the next key function to look at when you're looking at assessing the optic nerve functions. And you can have a lot of causes for optic disc edema, which could be either uniocular or binocular. And a pseudopapilledema or a, an appearance of a raised bilateral disc as compared to a papilledema is one of the most important differentials you'll see in a patient suspected of papilledema. You would see subnormal vision in papilledema, maybe mildly decreased in early phases, but it's normal in pseudopapilledema. Pupils get only affected in atrophic stages of papilledema. They're normal in pseudopapilledema. The cup is obscured in papilledema, but it may be a small cupless disc. And of course, the other signs of hemorrhages, distended vessels, obscured vessels, pattern lines, and of course, uh, you may see margins that are very significantly blurred. So these are all the possible presentations you can confuse with papilledema. So one on top is a pseudopapilledema, exactly what we were talking about. The margins are blurred, but there is virtually no disc. The vessels are branching at the as they emerge from the disc and spreading out, but they are all very clearly visible. There is no obscuration of the vessels. There are no hemorrhages. There, there, are, there is no appearance, appearance of any exudates. It's, otherwise, the rest is absolutely clear. And contrast this with this field, this image, you can hardly see the margins, hemorrhages, exudates, exudates going right up to the uh, fovea. So this is a papilledema. Another, another presentation, again, misdiagnosed as a papilledema, but you can see the hemorrhages and the exudates are very far away from the disc and have no connection to the disc in some conditions, in some parts. So this is great for hypertensive retinopathy. And, and finally, this image here, you can see a lumpy, bumpy appearance. It looks, the margins look irregular, but there is no clear edema that you can see. The vessels are fairly sharp. You can, there are no obscurations. And other than the margins being blurred, the rest of the retina in the peripapillary area looks fairly clear. So this are optic nerve head drusen. So a very good examination, detailed examination of the disc can, is very important component of, a, of assessing disc functions. And of course, here in this patient, you can see the presence of a very high reflective signal from the optic nerve head showing drusens.
you have bilateral disc edema you look at papillary edemas bilateral papillitis and if you have unilateral disc edema you think in terms of whether it's hyperemic or pale in hyperemic you have papillitis asymmetric papillary edema compressive neuropathies and pale disc edemas are usually ischemic in etiology again disc appearance just to show you the kinds of disc we tend to see so you can see a very subtle inferior pallor is there the superior half of the disc looks pretty good the patient has a, had a field defect presented with central field defect and the diagnosis of nain and you can see the other eye it's a virtually cupless small disc and this is a disc at risk again a susceptible disc for nain this is the field defect that the patient had in this eye and nain you can see a uh, bilateral disc pallor this was a patient of ethambutal toxicity again assessing the disc is important in what possible etiology it could be here you can see myelinated nerve fibers the patient presented with a field defect but you look at this it's because of the entire retina is obscured by the extensive myelination in one area so the field defect is because of the obstruction of light uh, re reaching the photoreceptors by the myelination this is a patient of optic neuritis you can see the blurred margin now this is different from papillary edema where you have a hugely elevated disc this is mildly elevated you may see some splinter hemorrhages but it's not as angry looking as papillary edema optic atrophy you you get to see over time so optic atrophy is a late feature and would usually present with a long standing visual dysfunction and sometimes it's important to remember the disc pallor may not correlate with the visual function you can based on the appearance of the disc classify and get an idea of the etiology primary optic atrophy the disc has sharp margins basically the disc has not undergone any edema swelling inflammation and the appearance of the disc is a pale disc which with sharp margins and the cup may be visible so these are because of space occupying lesions demyelination toxic a nutritional or any injury to the insult or injury to the optic nerve in the retro uh, in the posterior part of the optic nerve secondary optic atrophy essentially occurs if there has been some swelling edema or inflammation of the optic nerve like we would see in ischemic neuropathies neuritis or post papillary edema so here the margins are blurred there is a, a a waxy dirty looking appearance the cup is obliterated the vessels are sheathed and the retin retinal vessels are attenuated so this is what would be termed as a secondary optic atrophy and an excavated or a cavernous optic atrophy the most important differential of course is glaucoma but you see them after methyl mm -hmm. alcohol toxicity or any significant or large toxicity to the optic nerve congenital anomalies of course because of hypoplasia or coloboma and space occupying lesions so this is where the disc will be gently sloped and excavated and would have a very large cup the other way of assessing the optic nerve now which is increasingly being done are the oct to so just to show you here there is disc edema you can see the lines are just running off the the normal green pattern where the thickness of the optic nerve is so there is something which is increased the height of the optic uh, disc and you can see there is edema here this is called a lazy y sign showing that there is fluid which is tapering away as you go away from the disc and the height of the disc is so large so this is an optic disc drusen you can see elevated disc but you can see shadowing behind and this is because of the shadows behind a drusen but there are no subretinal spaces so this is a way to differentiate between drusens and papillary edema you won't have any subretinal space or fluid here but you can see these hyperreflective structures within the uh, these structures which have a cavity or a shadow between the other thing that is important in assessing the optic nerve are imaging or neuroimaging here is a patient of papillary edema you can see this the ring sign or the signet ring sign where the optic nerve is in the middle and you can see the fluid all around so again in papillary edema i want to see uh, or in early papillary edema where i'm not sure of the uh, significant edema that may be there and the patient is in the early period i can do an imaging to find out if there is edema posteriorly or not again of course in disc pallors you want to rule out a space occupying lesion ideally do an mri but even a ct can suffice if you direct the radiologist where you want the lesion to be so in a bilateral disc pallor you're looking at the cellar region to identify again in patients with trauma 
like in this case, you can see the fracture has actually transected the optic nerve, and this is a direct injury. Whereas here, you can see there is injury here, there is a fracture here, but you cannot see any transaction of the optic nerve. A, a patient with disc pallor because of compressive optic neuropathy because of osteopetrosis. So again, you may require a, a variety of imaging to understand what is the cause of the appearance of abnormal disc presentation that we see. This was a patient who had bilateral gunshot wounds and again, a patient with optic disc bruises. Uh, finally, visual evoke potentials will be discussed. And I just want to say it's a very, very important investigation, especially when you want to assess for the function of the optic nerve. It tells us a flash will tell us the integrity of the visual pathway and the pattern or the checkerboard pattern will, will also be able to help us to assess the amount of visual acuity that is present uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the optic nerves or the functional ability. Uh, pattern is very sensitive to refractive errors and degree of arousal and therefore uh, it can be wrongly interpreted or wrongly presented or maybe wrongly low but the patient may have normal function so that needs to be done very carefully it is a uh, abnormal or increase in p100 latency in the pattern bp is strongly suggestive of optic nerve disease but is not pathognomonic of optic neuritis that is something that we must remember and always uh, make sure that we're not missing something else. So I just want to say that a comprehensive assessment of all things that are uh, carried by the visual, uh, by the optic nerve are important so that you can assess all optic nerve functions in totality, get an idea of the etiology and carry on your investigations based on what you suspect as a cause. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk, sir. It has been very really inclusive. Uh, we have got so many questions lined up for you. I think we can take the questions uh, after, after sir's talk. So, uh, sir, would you like to share your screen, sir? Uh, yeah. Do you want to take the questions now, or because if the topics are, if the questions are probably not related to electrodiagnostics, then you could. Uh, sir, actually, there are a few questions related to electrodiagnostics as well, like four or five questions, and uh, so we can finish the talk and then take the uh, questions together, maybe. Sure. Okay, so I hope my screen is visible. I'll start off very quickly with electrodiagnostics, which is not a very, um, let's say, a very uh, favorite topic amongst postgraduate students. But I do enjoy it because it combines some basic understanding of uh, you know, uh, physics as well as physiology and anatomy of the eye. Uh, today we'll be chiefly talking about the electroretinogram, the visual evoked potential, the electrooculogram, and we won't be mentioning too much about the about electronystagmography or electromyography, which are other uh, technically electrodiagnostic tests used in ophthalmology. So let's start with the ERG. The electroretinogram is nothing but a record of a diffuse electrical response. And this is generated from the retina by both neural as well as non-neural cells. So it's a mass electrical activity from the retina in response to some visual stimulation. But it's important that this uh, concept of a mass activity is understood. It does not have much of a localizing value except for the cell type, as we shall see a little later. These are various recording electrodes that have been in use since many, many decades now. And you can see from the photographs that uh, many of them are cumbersome to use. They have to be inserted into the eye using a speculum and uh, many of them are contact electrodes. And uh, while many of our patients who would require an ERG belong to the pediatric age group, these are not very friendly electrodes for a pediatric population. But with advances in uh, technology, now we have these sticker sensor strips, which can just be stuck to the side of the uh, eye or the lower eyelid, and they do very well the job of uh, the older types of contact electrodes. So as technology changes, uh, the um, you know, ease of use of these tests also is going to improve. <clears throat> the German word Gansfeld basically means whole field or the entire field. And just as you have a perimeter which has a Gansfeld bowl, 
the flash tests, that is the flash ERG and the flash VEP require this Gansfeld bowl, uh, which is almost as big as a normal automated perimeter. But again, uh, technological advances allow us to have handheld devices. And you can see this device, which has a small eye cup, just fits over the eyeball. And this can easily be done in a recumbent patient, in a comatose patient, in a patient under anesthesia, or even in a sleeping child or a sleeping baby. So this is another technological advance. And this is the instrument we have at our hospital. Coming now to the normal ERG waveform. There are a few terminologies that one needs to get very familiar with. An A wave, a B wave, and in certain animal studies, a C wave has also been described. We'll come to uh, which are the um, cells that are responsible for these. But essentially, an A wave is an electronegative wave that is seen shortly after the stimulus is provided. And it is followed by an electropositive B wave. So the A wave, as you can well imagine, is the first wave. And hence, it has to arise from cells which are stimulated first. And those cells are nothing but the photoreceptors. So the A wave is derived from both the rods and cones, depending on the testing conditions. In other words, the, the photoreceptors. The photoreceptors then pass on the signal to the bipolar cells. And you can remember bipolar and B uh, as a small uh, aid memoir, aid de memoir to remind you that the B wave is derived from bipolar cells. Now, uh, the A wave is electronegative. Once again, if you just recall physiology, you remember that the photoreceptors actually hyperpolarize. That is, the inner cellular potential becomes more electronegative because of closure of potassium channels. And uh, that is why the A wave actually is negative. And then the stimulus is passed on to the B wave, uh, to the bipolar cells, and the B wave is positive wave. Another important waveform is the oscillatory potentials. And these are extracted, actually, from the ascending limb of the B wave. So if we magnify and amplify the B wave ascending limb, we get these very small little wavelets. And these wavelets are der derived from the amacrine cells. So they are essentially, uh, their importance lies in that they are absent in patients who suffer from inner retinal disorders or inner retinal ischemia, especially severe diabetic retinopathy or ischemic CRVO. <clears throat> the ERG can also be modified to distinguish signals arising from rods and from cones based on these different properties of the two cells. So we know these that the rods are sensitive to dim light compared to cones. The rods get saturated at lower frequencies. That means if you continuously, repetitively present a stimulus, the rods get saturated at uh, repetitions of less than 10 hertz or less than 10 cycles per second, whereas the cones would require much higher frequencies to get saturated. Uh, the color of the, uh, the light that is used can also be help, uh, helpful to differentiate the, the two cells. And the rates of dark adaptation are also useful. <clears throat> So this translates into what is called the ISCEV protocols. The ISCEV is nothing but a study group that uh, laid down the standardization for these electrophysiological tests. And what they suggest is 20 minutes of dark adaptation, followed by these three tests, which are the rod response, the standard combined response, and the oscillatory potentials. 10 minutes of light adaptation will then follow, in which after which the cone responses, that is the single flash cone response and 30 hertz flicker are, are checked. So this is how a normal ERG printout looks like. And I urge everybody to familiarize yourself with these five terms and these five tests and these five images of the waves, because this is how you would be then interpreting a normal or abnormal ERG. So the first three in the red box are cons uh, constitute the scotopic ERG, that is they are performed after dark adaptation and they principally examine the rods. Uh, so they are called the scotopic ERG. They constitute the scotopic ERG. The bottom two within the blue box are performed after light adaptation, and they principally test the cones, which is why they constitute the photopic component of the ERG. So let's take an example. Now, I've condensed the normal ERG into that small red box on the left of your screen. And uh, this is a printout of the ERG and the five waves that we are supposed to look at in detail. So as we mentioned earlier, the first three are the scotopic ERG, 
and uh, do we have anybody from the hot seat uh, with joining us yes sir there is dr soni dr soni uh, if if you if you can see the screen um, could you give us some interpretation or some analysis prima facie what what are you looking at there is no rod response okay uh, there is no combined res response either very good eyes um, and uh, in the uh, light after after the light adaptation we can't see the cone response either that's right exactly so uh, very well uh, summarized you can see that the scotopic erg is almost flat or extinguished and so is the photopic erg it's also flat and extinguished and you have much reduced amplitudes of the oscillatory potentials so you are dealing with a disease that has affected both the rods as well as the cones and quite severely so would you like to hazard a guess dr soni what are we dealing with what types of conditions or what is your differential diagnosis the retinitis pigment also uh, excellent so this is the uh, the um main type of uh, diagnosis for this kind of extinguished erg and advanced retinitis pigmentosa which has now proceeded to uh, involve both the rods as well as the cones but other differential diagnoses would include leber congenital am amaurosis a total long standing retinal detachment where uh, now the retina is thin and atrophic and is not capable of producing any electrical signal an ophthalmic artery occlusion simply because once again if you recall basic anatomy of the retina or the retinal blood supply the outer one third of the retina is supplied blood or nutrition from the choroid and the inner two thirds gets its nutritional supply from the central retinal artery so in an occlusion of the ophthalmic artery there is interruption of the choroidal as well as the central retinal artery art, artery uh, circulation and that's why both the a wave and the b wave would be absent however if you are dealing with a disorder that affects only the inner retinal circulation for example a central retinal arterial occlusion you would get an a wave but an absent or a diminished b wave because as we uh, recall the a wave derived from photoreceptors is supplied blood from by the choroid or the choriocapillaries so other examples of extinguished erg would include retinal aplasia and a long standing siderosis let's look at this other example uh, once again i've put in the uh, normal erg waveforms on the left and here you can see that very obviously the photopic erg is almost extinguished almost flatlining the scotopic erg is also a little abnormal you don't get a very high b wave as you normally should you're getting a small a wave here in the maximum combined response and a diminished or attenuated b wave so this is a disease that is predominantly affecting the cones but is also affecting the rods to some extent and hence you could classify this as a cone rod dystrophy or a cone dystrophy cone dystrophies uh, also have the additional clinical features of having photoaversion nystagmus progressive loss of vision impaired color vision and acquired nystagmus and the visual fields show a central scotoma now it's very important to correlate the erg findings with the clinical findings uh, no test should be taken in isolation to come to any particular diagnosis because similar um, test results could be seen in a variety of clinical conditions so one would need additional information about the fundus morphology or uh, the age of the patient or the symptomatology of the patient before coming to a real diagnosis this is a third example and here you can see what we were discussing a little earlier the right eye erg appears to be quite normal mimicking the normal erg given to you here and whereas the left eye shows an attenuated b wave in the um, scotopic erg whereas the photopic appears normal but if you look closely at the oscillatory potentials you can see that the oscillatory potentials in the left eye are definitely diminished or attenuated compared to the right eye so here we are dealing with a disorder of the inner retinal circulation which is affecting the b wave and the oscillatory potential and as we discussed earlier these are uh, the two important ones ischemic crvo and advanced diabetic retinopathy briefly talking about the pattern erg the pattern erg has a different waveform and uh, different 
names to those wa uh, wave components. The P50 wave is the uh, positive wave that is seen about 50 milliseconds after the onset of stimulus. And the N95 wave is seen about 95 milliseconds after the onset of stimulus and is a negative wave. Hence the terms P and N denoting the positivity or negativity of the wave. The P50 is thought to be derived mainly from the retina and the N95 from the ganglion cells or the optic nerve. And hence, specific abnormalities in either the P50 or the N95 would help to localize a lesion to either the retina or the optic nerve. Now, the pattern ERG is mostly used in um, particular cases of ocular hypertension, glaucoma, or optic neuropathies, not very commonly used in retinal practice, but it is also a useful research tool in these set settings. The multifocal ERG provides this beautiful multicolored printout of this lovely Mount Everest-like peak. And uh, this color-coded printout is very useful in three-dimensionally almost mapping the macular region. And it's very useful for detecting localized abnormalities of the retina, unlike an ERG, a flash ERG, which is very, uh, provides only very diffuse understanding of the retinal electric activity. So here you can very nicely see or get delineated um, ring scotoma or a bullseye maculopathy. So the multifocal ERG is particularly used in patients with chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine retinal toxicity. These are a few of the clinical indications for ERG. It's mainly an aid to diagnosis in patients with inherited retinal degenerations and dystrophies, where uh, one can also additionally screen clinically un unaffected family members one can assess patients of siderosis or retinotoxic medications like chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, patients with ocular hypertension or glaucoma. In the follow-up of patients with ischemic retinopathy due to CRVO or advanced diabetic retinopathy, and very commonly as a um, method of looking for retinal toxicity of various intravitreal drugs or surgeries and procedures. And this has a very important role in the uh, approval of such medications or therapies. We'll quickly move on to visual evoked potential. The VEP now is a totally different type of test and uh, it is a part of a group of tests called evoked uh, potentials. Now the evoked potential is nothing but electrical as, uh, activity that is measured in response to a stimulus. And uh, obviously when that stimulus is provided by a visual means it is called a visual evoked potential. It's measured by placing electrodes over the head of the patient, but principally at the inion, which is the bony landmark at the occipit occipital bone, and it overlies the visual cortex or the occipital cortex. An important concept is that the VEP is, is largely dependent on the macular function for two reasons. One is that the macular fibers project principally to the occipital pole, whereas the extramacular or peripheral retinal fibers get buried into the calcarine sulcus. And also the macular signal, as it approaches the cortex, keeps getting amplified at each and every stage. So the macular signal at the, uh, in the occipital cortex amounts for a much larger surface area compared to the peripheral retina. Again, important uh, to understand is that the VEP is, could be abnormal from a defect anywhere ranging from the macula right up to the visual cortex. Any part of the visual pathway, if it is affected, could give rise to a, an abnormal VEP. So it is not a localizing test with regard to location within the visual pathway. These are just some of the images from the ISCEV um, protocols that tell us where the electrodes should be placed. But it's as these are scalp electrodes, one important uh, thing to remember is that these electrodes have to be placed parting the hair and right onto the scalp skin. And a patient who has used a lot of hair oil, uh, these electrodes don't get a good contact with the skin. So you need to tell the patient to wash their hair with shampoo and not use any oil before they come for the test. Uh, Dr. Rohit Saxena uh, spoke a little bit about the various stimuli that are provided. You could do a flash VEP or you could also have a pattern reversal VEP. I'll try to quickly show you what a pattern reversal VEP looks like. This is a checkerboard pattern of alternating black and white squares and the pattern reverses. Uh, 
So as you can see, the pattern reverses, but the total number of black and white squares remains the same. So at any point in time, the overall brightness that is used to stimulate the retina is the same. And the differences in electrical activity obtained by alternating the stimulus is what is measured in a pattern BEP. So the BEP has to be ideally performed without pupillary dilatation. One eye is recorded or measure, uh, uh, tested at a time. The patient should ideally wear their refractive correction and sit comfortably in front of the monitor. And generally two to three check sizes are used before one ends the test. A normal VEP looks something like this. The most important wave that one has to concentrate on is the P100 wave. The P100 wave is a positive wave that occurs about 100 milliseconds after onset of stimulus. How does one analyze the VEP waveform? So one important parameter is the amplitude. The amplitude is measured along the y-axis in terms of micro volts. It's basically the height or depth of the wave from its trough to the peak. The next parameter is the latency. That is the amount of time it took for, from the onset of stimulus for that peak or trough to be achieved. So it is measured in milliseconds and it's measured along the x-axis. And the third parameter is the overall waveform. How does it look? Uh, that also gives clues to uh, certain lesions, especially compressive optic neuropathies. So the amplitude of the uh, VEP is subject to a large variability between patients. So you, you, it's very difficult to depend upon an absolute measurement of the uh, height of the P100 wave. It's more useful to compare one eye with the other, especially if one eye is deemed to be abnormal and the other is deemed to be normal. If there is a uh, uh, reduction in the amplitude relative to the normal eye, that is more useful. But in general, if the P100 wave is less than five microvolts, you could call it abnormal. Latency will also vary a lot from uh, patient to patient, depending on pupil size, age, refractive state, and other stimulus factors. But you could compare it to age matched normals. And a rule of thumb is that if the P100 wave does not peak even within 110 milliseconds, then you should consider this an abnormally delayed uh, uh, P100 wave. Now, when is the VEP used? The flash VEP is mainly used in patients who have dense media opacities. And various studies have shown that uh, normal VEP obtained in patients who have dense cataract or vitreous hemorrhage correlates with the visual recovery these patients have after surgery. So you could prognosticate preoperatively patients with dense uh, cataracts and vitreous hemorrhage. It's also useful in preverbal children where one can get an idea as to the integrity of the visual pathway. And similarly in uh, patients who are non-verbal because of um, um, psychiatric or mental illness or patients who have learning disabilities where they cannot communicate for visual, uh, uh, visual equity testing. This is the VEP of a patient with a traumatic optic neuropathy in the left eye. And just to show you how the uh, waveforms differ, first of all, you can see that the left eye waveform is a little more attenuated and overall the amplitudes or the, uh, are much lower than the right eye. The right eye P100 wave co corresponds very well to the 100 millisecond mark, whereas in the left eye, it is definitely delayed to about 115 or 120 milliseconds. So it tells us that there is an abnormality in the left eye visual pathway and confirms our clinical uh, diagnosis of a traumatic optic neuropathy. Pattern VEPs are most commonly used in patients with optic neuritis and multiple sclerosis, where the characteristic finding is an increased latency of the P100 wave. And also of note is that even though the uh, acute attack of optic neuritis may have subsided, this P100 latency increase persists and may last lifelong. So in a patient who has no history of optic neuritis, if you do a pattern VEP and detect an increased latency of the P100 wave, you could assume in a patient with multiple sclerosis that the patient had had a prior episode of optic neuritis. In patients who have functional vision loss or non-organic vision, vision loss, either 
that is malingering or what is used to be called hysteria or conversion disorder a recordable pattern bp to small checks at least establishes the presence of an intact visual pathway so you may not be able to uh, exactly uh, know what the patient is seeing but at least you could come to a conclusion that the electronic impulses are being carried forth from the uh, eye to the occipital cortex and that the uh, visual pathway is intact i'll very briefly talk about the electrooculogram it's basically it's a test that is based on the measurement of potential difference between the cornea and the back of the eye even an, in the resting state the cornea is 6 millivolts more positive compared to the back of the eye and based on this test we uh, uh, on this basis you could call the eye a dipole now how is it tested electrodes are placed at the inner and the outer canthi of the eye and the patient is asked to make saccadic eye movements of about 30 degrees between two uh, two um, different targets when the eye moves towards one canthus a particular uh, potential is recorded in that electrode and a similar corresponding potential is recorded in the other electrode and when the eye moves to the towards the other electrode uh, uh, the converse is recorded so what one gets when the eye keeps moving like this is a sort of sinusoidal or um, a waveform like this with peaks and troughs the test is performed with 15 minutes when the with the ambient lights ambient illumination is on and for 15 minutes when the lights are off sorry off and then on and then you get two values which is the dark trough and the light peak so the dark trough meaning the lowest height of the uh, the um uh, of the electrical uh, potential that is recorded when the lights are off and the light peak is the highest peak of the electrical potential when the lights are on and the ratio between these two that is the light peak to the dark trough ratio is called the arden ratio it should be about 1.8 anything less than 1.8 is considered abnormal so the eog is basically uh, used in these conditions and in these conditions the eog is abnormal whereas the erg is normal in most other conditions where the erg is abnormal the eog will also be abnormal but there are these only very few handful of conditions especially best dystrophy where the eog remains where the eog is abnormal but the erg may remain normal so i'll end my talk over here i hope i have electrified you rather than shocking you into a comatose state and i wish all of the postgraduate students who are appearing for exams all the very best that's my email address if anybody wishes to get in touch for additional questions or doubts i'm more than happy to help wonderful talk sir i think it's a neurophilmology feast for all the postgraduates today with two great talks yeah we have uh, lots of questions lined up for both of you thank you so much uh, professor saxena and uh, dr devendra yeah uh, sir uh, there there is a question are sticker sensor strips available in india oh very much so we are uh, happy to use them quite uh, frequently they are generally um, there are some issues because they are barcoded so you need to scan that barcode and they are ideally supposed to use be used only one for one uh, patient but yes they are very much available in india so uh doc so there is a question uh, arcuate defects are present both in uh, uh, glaucoma and nan so how exactly do you differentiate if the visual field defect is because of glaucoma or nan so uh, one of course uh, the key question answer is that you never diagnose a field you diagnose the patient so obviously you are looking at the disc uh, before you make any uh, presumptions to the possibility ology so in a glaucoma patient if you if you see a notching at the upper end of the at the other end of the pole you are thinking in terms of glaucoma whereas if you see pallor but there is no notching you are thinking in terms of ischemic neuropathy and as i had shown that on this photograph there is going to be a corresponding pallor and a retinal nerve fiber layer in the opposite side of the field so that is of course clinical assessment when you're looking at field defects uh, 
usually the glaucomatous field effect will be originating from the optic nerve head and going along in arcuate fashion because it is one part of that because the damage is uh, because of the pressure at that pole or that point of the optic nerve head whereas in ischemic neuropathy the, it is a diffuse loss so it's not going to be classically arcuate you are going to see a fair amount of diffuse loss or damage to the field so it's not going to be classically arcuate but it may be appearing like an arcuate but usually it's more of a altitudinal defect where one half of the field or a large part of the field is affected uh would you like to add freshman yeah i mean uh, we've discovered it uh, successfully basically in in uh, ischemic optic neuropathy you will more often than not you'll find that the arcuate defect is approaching the fixation or the center quite often versus glaucomatous arcuate defects which would be at least in the initial period we avoiding the central area because they affect the arcuate fibers Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, question: uh, ERG. Uh, what are the ERG changes uh, in the early RP? Uh, the I think this is the question regarding the first uh, ERG in which the advanced RP was noted. So it was like early RP changes will be different. So, yeah. So uh, retinitis pigmentosa is basically a photoreceptor degeneration which starts with the rods. So in a patient with Uh, early or let us say established retinitis pigmentosa where the macula is not totally involved one normally gets abnormalities in the scotopic erg that is the dark adapted erg or the rod tests uh, whereas the photopic erg may appear to be quite normal and as the uh, disease progresses as you remember rp starts mainly in the mid periphery and then sort of progresses both peripherally as well as centrally as the macula gets more and more involved the photopic erg also gets affected so when the patient has very poor visual acuity is also when you would notice that the uh, uh, erg is almost totally extinguished so the same continuation to this question I, there is a, a clinical scenario they have told uh, there is a total disc pallor in one patient with 6 by 12 vision in uh, both eyes and uh, he has a complaints of night vision night blindness on probing so what uh, what we what should be the next uh, electrophysiological test we order erg or vp because uh, of... so generally we order electrophysiological tests after i mean as a part of the sequence we order them pretty much towards the end so there would be a lot of other clues on various other optic nerve function tests as dr sachena spoke about earlier which would probably may not mean may or even obviate the need for electrophysiological testing so i think uh, i dr saxena would elaborate very nicely on that so key things would be uh, a retinal exam and of course a visual fields so these would be your first key uh, evaluations that you are going to do so that you get an idea again whether you are looking at a retinal disorder or you are looking at an optic nerve disorder so key is to identify where is the site of the problem and then as they when they said you have to tailor your investigation based on what is your differentials and your most likely possible reason yes rashmi uh, and yes and one has to remember that is remember that vp measures the electrical activity of the whole of visual pathway yes uh, even if somebody who has a photoreceptor degeneration or has a uh, rp you will find that the vpa has been affected because there is no electrical activity generated in the first place and in the in today's day and world as devendra and ruit said we are going to order electrical uh, electrophysiology when we are not very sure uh, as to what exactly would be the disease entity or where the disease entity is entity is originated so in most instances will end up ordering erg and vp both if you are not very sure whether the origin is in, in retina or in optic nerve having said that the, the symptom of night blindness is not very commonly yeah. seen in optic neuropathy yeah but obviously uh, let's not jump to conclusions i think the take home should be that do everything in a very uh, systematic manner from simple based tests to more advanced uh, perimetry to the most advanced or less least performed 
electrophysiological tests. Of course, of course. I, I, I didn't mean for... No, uh, I, yeah, yeah. No, no, of course. No, I, I was just uh, summarizing for a postgraduate student. So, there is a repeat question from last session. What is the difference between RAPD grade 4 and 5? <laughs> So, very, uh, I mean, these are, uh, frankly, I would say these are very minor differences that have been graded. So, if you see a very, very immediate dilatation, so you are looking at a grade 5 or a grade 6 RAPD. Whereas, if you see that very subtle, um, uh, the pupil remains same or there is one slight, temp you know, slight inward movement of the pupil and then it dilates, it's like grade 5. So these are very, you know, I mean, I showed the table, but they're very, very subtle differences. The best way to measure or to follow up RAPD or to assess it is using a graded neutral density filter. So all these clinical tests are more or less RAPD is there or not there. It is early sign. So once it's well established, when you're looking at four and five, you have visual functions already significantly affected which would probably be more sensitive way of following up the patient. And if actually you want to measure so that you can follow up and see whether it's improving or not, then you should use a graded neutral density filter. And the way of using it is you put it in front of the better eye and you increase the density of the filter till there is no RAPD in the eye affected. So that is uh, in, in logs, it will give you a measurement of the amount of RAPD. That would be a better assessment than, you know, trying to, Split hairs in grade four, five, and six. So, uh, in uh, hydrochloroquine toxicity, what is the role of focal ERG in the diagnosis? And is there any role of EOG in such cases? And which one is more sensitive? No, so, hydroxychloroquine uh, toxicity is basically a retinal uh, toxicity. Uh, actually, chloroquine toxicity, toxicity is much more common because in the past chloroquine was uh, used and it is definitely more retinotoxic than hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine produces retinal toxicity only after many, many years of usage. So essentially the pattern of uh, the uh, involvement of the retina is in the bullseye or a, what is called a bullseye maculopathy where the fovea is spared for a long time and one gets a ring of involvement in the parafovial uh, region. So. A flash ERG may be normal because a flash ERG gets affect, affected only when a large area of the retina is affected. What is uh, used in these cases is not a focal, it's called a multifocal ERG. And that multifocal ERG tests very many points in the central macula to 20 degrees of the uh, retina. And one can almost topographically analyze which are the areas of the retina which are affected more and which are not affected. So a multifocal ERG is definitely going to be helpful because it would demonstrate that the fovea has a nice normal peak, whereas the multi, uh, sorry, whereas the uh, parafovial region is depressed into an abnormal zone. And uh, EOG does not really have any role in this kind of condition. Question came probably because in COVID times, a lot of people have been consuming uh, it's Yeah, equal. I guess. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, there was a question the, in the figures you showed in uh, pseudo papilledema. Mm -hmm. So, figure two papilledema or not? Uh, now, it's so difficult to say, but I'll, 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 I mean, good that people remember the figures so far, so late into the talk. But so, essentially, the top figure was pseudo papilledema. The second figure was true papilledema because not only was there obscuration of the disc, you could see exudates, hemorrhages which were all touching the disc and arising from it. The lowermost image was of a grade four, four hypertensive retinopathy, where the edema was not the significant feature. The feature were the hemorrhages and the exudates, which were present further away from the retina with a normal lying retina in the middle. So you were not having the fluid seeping from the disc and causing all those features. And of course, the last on the right was uh, Drusen. So the center one, yes, was true papilledema. In fact, that was a well-established papilledema. So there is one more question. Uh, there is a confusion between uh, uh, sectoral edema in optic nerve head and hyperemia and how exactly to differentiate it. Will dysphosity help in differentiating the same? 
um, sectoral edema and hy hyperemia. So they are actually uh, describing two different aspects of our disk assessment. So sectoral edema means the edema of fluid is in uh, a sector of the disk. And usually we would, and hyperemia and pallor are the color related aspects we wish to talk about. So you could have sectoral edema, which could be hyperemic or pale. More often than not, we have sectoral palish edema, which would be in NAIN, but in early stages of NAIN, it could even be a little hyperemic. Mm -hmm. And if there is optic neuritis, which is involving only a small area of the disc, then it could be a sectoral hyperemic edema. So sectoral edema, total edema, uh, uh, hemidisc edema. So all these things are basically descriptive terminologies. And again, so is the color. So your assessment of the color, it may not necessarily be that uh, ischemic will always have pale disc edema. You could even have a little bit of initial hyperemia, which becomes pale over time. So uh, that is the kind of description of the disc. And sorry, I forgot what was the second corollary part of the disc. Question? Uh, sir, is this positive really helpful? Ah. So there's a confusion in the diagnosis. So again, uh, a good uh, stereoscopic disc assessment is probably still the best. Yes, OCT may help us. It would show some, uh, uh, you know, edema. So if you're looking at whether it's complete or it's just involving a part of the disc, yes, an OCT uh, would help us. But uh, again, uh, it does not help us so much as far as etiology or, uh, you know, uh, diagnosis is concerned. So still, I mean, the best uh, would be a good stereoscopic disc assessment. Uh, there is a question in VEP. So, what is uh, like? So, if no, what is the normal VEP values if it's greater than five millivolt and less than uh, 110 milliseconds? So, does it come under normal VEP? Yeah. So, five microvolts. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, now VEP is very amenable to artifacts and very amenable to uh, changes uh, from person to person. So, I would not suggest mugging up or memorizing you know absolute values when you have to interpret the uh, the test which is placed in front of you what is more relevant and useful and generally what is asked in an exam for example would be uh, normal one eye and the other eye would be abnormal so you could very easily pick up a difference between the normal and the abnormal eye so uh, an attenuated or a reduced amplitude of the uh, vp signal would be very obvious and a delay in the p100 as i mentioned which is the positive wave, which should appear at 100 milliseconds. If it appears more than 110 milliseconds after presenting the stimulus, then that should be considered abnormal at any age uh, less than 60 years. So these are the few points that one should keep in mind. Latency is very, very robust. As, as, as Devinder is saying, like 100 milliseconds, maximum 110, and you will definitely call it uh, delayed. The amplitude can be variable depending also on the testing conditions. And many labs may have a little variable normals, what they call. So um, uh, the amplitude may not be that robust an investigation, but latency, yes is a very, very important. You, it's called P100 because it's supposed to come at 100. Uh, Sir, so, uh, why is diabetes mellitus a secondary optic atrophy? So it's not diabetes causing secondary optic atrophy. It is ischemic optic neuropathy secondary to diabetes or papilloflebitis secondary associated with diabetes that will present to us as secondary optic atrophy. So, uh, uh, there is a request for you. Can you briefly describe the handheld instrument you have showed that you uh, yeah. If you want, I could try to... Uh... Okay, so basically it's a, it's a handheld device, obviously, and it is uh, it has a uh, cup which fits over the eye and that cup uh, you know, can be used even in a recumbent patient or a patient who is uh, uh, a, a small baby that's being held by the parents. So you can see that this eye cup over here fits over the eyeball. You, the, the sensor strip has a little uh, electrode that you attach both to the sensor strip and the other end goes into the machine over here. And you have an infrared camera inside which shows you the, the eye over here, as you can see the eye. Uh, no, uh, so you know that the eye is open and you have a thumb joystick where you switch on and you start the test. 
and it, it flashes the light in so you can uh, do the flash ERG and flash VP. Just a caveat, this is only for flash testing. Pattern ERG and pattern VEP or multifocal ERGs are not possible with this device. They are only for testing uh, flash ERG and flash VEP. Okay, sir. sir, there is a question. Uh, how to differentiate between cavernous optic atrophy and glaucomatous optic atrophy? Both have deep cups. So, um, so it's it you it's not possible to say just on the disc appearance because cavernous optic atrophy is a descriptive sign which would include, as I said, the most common differential being glaucoma. So, and ex usually the other causes of cavernous optic atrophy you would not have such a deep cup, but over time, so essentially what, what is happening? Something is causing loss of nerve fiber layer without any replacement by any nerve, by any gliosis or anything for that matter. So slowly the, the nerve fibers or the nerves are just dropping out and there is empty space there. So uh, in glaucoma, it's because of pressure that the pressure induced nerves are just losing, dropping out, getting lost. And uh, there is nothing replacing that. And if there is a compressive lesion at the in the chiasma or say toxic, where there is no inflammation, so like methyl alcohol, a very significant damage to the optic nerves, to the axons, which totally get destroyed and over time they just drop out and there's nothing there. So usually you do not see very deep cups in uh, these conditions, but again, that's not sacrosanct. Some people have described a little bit of pigmentation that is seen around the optic nerve head in a toxic uh, disorder, especially after alcohol toxicity. But again, that's not a sacrosanct feature. So again, just on the disc appearance, not possible to make a, a definitive difference, difference. You need to do work up the patient for glaucoma or of course, ask a detailed history for toxic or of course, if highly suspicious, do an imaging to rule out a space occupying it. So I think the questions are not going to end. So <laughs> we are just going yeah. to take a last question here. Uh, so you uh, uh, you have mentioned imaging uh, in bilateral disc pallor. So do you uh, in consider imaging in all the bilateral disc pallor? And if you consider imaging, what will be the first choice of your investigation of choice? So uh, bilateral disc pallor, if I do not know the cause. If I know the cause, say a patient is a known patient of optic neuritis and has recurrent episodes of optic neuritis, I mean, uh, he obviously is likely to be have imaged in the past. So currently for diagnosis, I do not need an imaging, but I'm not, or he has a history of toxic intake. He is uh, ethambutol toxicity. So I'm pretty sure it's ethambutol toxicity. I mean, I would not image a pulmonary cox on follow-up, clear history, ethambutol toxicity, no need for image. But if I do not know the cause for optic atrophy or even mild disc pallors, I need to image. And the key thing is to know what to image. How to image is the secondary. First thing, bilateral disc pallor, you localize it at the chiasma. So you know that the chiasmal region has to be imaged. Preference is always to an MRI because suppose it is a tumor, even the neurosurgeon is going to require an MRI. So he won't need uh, a, you know, an imaging twice. And obviously there is no radiation risk, but in a, a cost country constrained ish, um, environment where the patient cannot afford an MRI, you can do a CT, but you need to tell where the site of lesion is. So you need to tell them that you want the cellar region to be very finely or closely imaged. So even a CT, just a coronal cut through the cellar region would be able to pick up a lesion, whether it's a pituitary adenoma, macroadenoma, or uh, any other lesion arising from an adjacent area. So anything is, uh, you need to localize the site and advise the radiologist where we are looking for. And if possible, of course, an MRI is prepared. Any specifications like contrast or non-contrast? So uh, again, uh, you, you would prefer a contrast always, but uh, in conditions which uh, it's not always essential to have a contrast. Usually you would again talk about the site of lesion in some areas or some regions like contrast will help us for inflammation, for muscle related, if you want to delineate muscle related issues, those are areas where contrast is essential. But otherwise, sometimes you can just get away without a contrast. Thank you, sir. Uh, so Dr. Rashman, do you want Rashman. to add? 
uh, do you want to add anything regarding the physiological tests or optic nerve tests? I think both the topics uh, have been covered uh, extensively and uh, in the discussions have been very illuminating. So I think both Devendra and Rohit has, has covered these uh, difficult and long topics you know, in a very focused way. So. And uh, uh, we have their email IDs, and if there are no questions, we can always discuss as we go along. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir, for this uh, feast today. Thank you, Asha. Very nice to meet you again, uh, at least virtually. Thanks, Rashmin. Thanks, Santosh. Thank you, everyone. It was very nice. Nicely conducted. Thanks. Okay, Devinder. Bye, sir. Bye. Bye-bye. Sir, you're muted. We couldn't.